Hey ye, hey ye, it's time for, I don't know why I started recording that way. It's time for the Big Lasso Season 3 wrap up slash review slash analysis slash whatever the hell else this is going to turn into. The big long Ted Lasso video. Um, it's been a, I'd say a divisive season. I think most of us can recognise there are faults here, some of which we will definitely be discussing, but I am mostly surprised just how many people seem to really hate this season. Personally, I found none of its flaws to be deal breakers, just kind of imperfections that I was willing to somewhat work with for the sake of enjoying what is still a very fun, meaningful show. I loved it, but yes, as I often praise this season for illustrating in my exhaustive video series on each episode, sometimes you have to recognise both the good and the bad, rather than just choosing one or the other, trying to find a way to balance both points in your mind, which is kind of what we're going to do today, going through the season one episode at the time, but I'll probably also veer off into tangents to mention how it links to stuff later on or to discuss things people have commented. That's all we need for an introduction though, we'll have no more of that. <laughs> let's get to, uh, let's get this video moving. We begin the season as we end it, which is a close-up of Ted's face. Here he looks sad because his son is going back home without him, where in the end he looks content because he is back home with his son. It's not the most subtle in that sense, but it's a really solid way to begin and end the season that also parallels them doing the same thing in season 2 with close-ups of Nate. This is the story I think most people were expecting this season, and a story that feels most right. Of course this is the arc. Ted decides to go back home to put his son ahead of his career in England. I would say that it's also that he achieved everything he needed to in England. You know, sure, Richmond's don't win the league, but he builds a real family there, something that can survive without him. He sets in place a new culture for the club and carved out a new identity for Richmond of emotional openness, I suppose you could call it. So it's not just that Henry needs him to come home, it's also that they don't need him to stay anymore even if they want him to. And I think they mostly do a good job of that. We'll discuss it more as we get into the season. This episode, we also get the wonderful images of Lego Nelson Road, which may very well be product placement. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know if people can really buy a Richmond stadium. Um, building something beautiful that is Richmond. That's what Ted's been doing. Something that hopefully culminates in a trophy. A trophy it's set up that Ted wants to win for his son as much as for Rebecca and the team itself. And I think they do a good job of setting up that idea. They do it wonderfully through the visual image of Nelson Road. Because yeah, ultimately winning won't be the point. Nor does Ted need to do that for Henry to make him proud or whatever. I'll be honest, this is the thing that got me most excited about season 3 when it was starting off. The idea of a sports film genuinely telling a story that winning isn't what matters. You know, not just a team coming close to winning but that's okay because they've all grown as people and it's still nice kind of thing, but here it's a sport film where Ted has to learn he doesn't need to make his son proud through career success. A story where in fact he ends with the complete opposite of career success really in terms of his final job. He will end literally working as a junior coach Coach, precisely because it's what brings him closer to Henry. And equally, Rebecca will learn she doesn't need to beat Rupert. Sport is such a perfect metaphor for exploring ideas of rivalry and defeating old abusers and how, yeah, ultimately you don't need to defeat them, you just need to move on. Beautiful, absolutely beautiful idea with the perfect metaphor of sport to play it out. I could not love that anymore as an idea, and on that line they also do a good job of setting up Rebecca's eagerness to beat Rupert in this first episode, and how it plays into the dynamic that she's painfully familiar with there. You know, Rupert being this powerful, rich figure with the really high class team that are bound to win the league, and Rebecca being the not that rich for a Premier League club underdog team that's predicted to finish 20th. How that just feels typical for her, you know, of course everyone is on Rupert's side, of course he has all the power and the admiration where I'm left to feel weak and worthless. In many ways that's exactly why Rupert bought West Ham in the first place, a kind of power move to put himself above Rebecca again. I do think they go a bit overboard this episode with people predicting Richmond's to be 20th and all of the Richmond players and everyone being outraged by it. Like, of course they're predicted to finish 20th, 
They just got promoted from the league below, and apart from when they later signed Zava, I'm not sure they've made any transfers at all. Of course they're predicted to finish last, that's not outrageous. What else happens this episode though? Uh, there's a good montage of Nate arriving at West Ham in his small old car, how vast West Ham feels in comparison to the very homely feel of Richmond's training grounds, that's great. We see him obsessing over his image online again, and we see him berating one of his players. I really liked these moments, and it does somewhat disappoint me because it's the only interaction we see Nate have with his players at all, really, besides, like, signalling to them during the West Ham Richmond game. I really wanted more. I wanted to see him showing that same behaviour just like he showed towards Will or Colin last season, having to learn how negative an effect it has on the team, and then realising, oh my god, I'm behaving just like my dad did, I'm shaming these players the way my dad used to shame me, thinking it would motivate me better when all it ever did was make me feel worthless. I'm doing the same thing to them, of course that's not good coaching, what have I been doing? You know, some sort of gradual revelation along those lines that can take part over the course of the season. A revelation that is somewhat in the show, but it doesn't land quite the way it deserves, precisely because we see so little of Nate actually coaching people. So that's true. Um, I will say this though. There is a point made in this episode about building, um, I, I guess families is the word, organisations, communities. We see Nate at West Ham tasked with trying to pull together the sort of united club that Ted built up with Richmond over the first two seasons. We see Keeley tasked with doing the same thing at KJPR. And when Nate has to handle a boss that isn't the um, best influence, as Rebecca wasn't in season one for Ted, Keely has to handle employees that don't really value her as a leader, the way neither Roy nor Jamie did of Ted in season 1. It'll take time to win them round, um, and I think this is a really solid idea. We kind of see the same also with Sam building the family at his restaurant. Ted is going to leave at the end of this season, so I think also seeing these other characters learn from what Ted did and move outwards to do the same in their own way, I think that's great. A lot of people criticise Keely's story in particular for being so disconnected from Richmond, and we will discuss that later on, but there is a strong premise in it, I think. Right now, for both Nate and Keeley in episode 1, it's not exactly working. Keely is left crying in her office and feeling alone, and yeah, of course disconnected from Richmond. That's half of her struggle, especially also when Rory dumped her. It's incredibly isolating and lonely to go out into this kind of office place, a, a world of sophisticated, swanky, office, high-class stuff that she's not, you know, massively familiar with and comfortable with, and to try and build something out of it. I think loneliness is very natural, and we will see her making the mistake of hiring Shandy, because Shandy is someone that feels familiar someone that can help Keeley feel connected again to, uh, something, but that's not yet. Generally, I think episode one is a really solid beginning that does a good job setting up the season. I particularly like how well it structures the episode as we kind of move between Richmond and West Ham, between Ted and Nate, paralleled most obviously when we go between their press conferences. We kind of go back and forth between them throughout this episode, and it creates a real sense of this rivalry. Builds it up as something palpable, only to, at the same time, puncture it by having Ted not lean into the rivalry, having Ted praise and show friendship towards Nate. Actually, I think just how organically they deliver that idea in the structure of this episode, I think that makes this episode a strong 9 out of 10 in my books. I'm sure that'll surprise a lot of you, I think a lot of people would score these early episodes quite low. But yeah, on to episode 2. It does explain why my office comes with fun features like this. Look, watch. Yes, World Anvil are still sponsoring me. This is a company I genuinely love. I'm going to keep promoting and supporting them as long as I physically can. <laughs> and all of you are going to listen intently. Um, World Anvil is an online tool for world building, character creation, story planning and writing, campaign building and playing lots of different games. A load of useful stuff. I use it for my novel with the sprawling mess all of my world building turned into and even just like <laughs> I was keen on my fictional town having a strong sense of community so there was pages after page of who lives where, what do they think of their neighbours, where do they work, what are their opinions on local gossip, 
I don't know, a very big sprawling mess that World Anvil can really help to organize with hyperlinks, different categories, timelines, you can even completely build out of your own designed calendars. Again, with hyperlinks attached to other articles and a map to link the different timeline events too, if you fancy that. When there is so much detail, it is hard to remember it all. And having something like this to just quickly glance at and see what happens where and when becomes so damn handy. And there are other tools as well. I've not used all of them yet myself, but all the ones I have used are pretty straightforward. They do have lots of tutorials for how to use everything, but I've never needed to watch them. I've just figured it out myself pretty easily. There is a link in the description, and as a pinned comment, there is the code TREE, which entitles you to 40% off any of their yearly subscriptions. And if you want to try it out first, they have a free version. Test that out for as long as you like first. Get familiar with World Anvil. You know, if you're interested, click the link. Well damn, Bill. So where the first episode is loosely structured around the rivalry, or not rivalry, but between Ted and Nate, episode 2 is structured around the rivalry between Rebecca and Rupert, um, if rivalry is even the right word. And again, I think that structure really makes this episode work, it gives it a good sense of drive. I have seen a lot of comments from people saying the first half of this season felt really slow, but I personally didn't feel that at all. I think in many ways this was the quickest part of the season. Well, not literally the quickest because later on we charge forward with abrupt time jumps and things but pacing wise I think this part of the season feels like it has proper momentum because of this sense of rivalry. Maybe it doesn't have the big payoff emotional moments that the later parts of the season gets but there is this good structure that keep things moving and um, I'm gonna say this now I think most people are gonna disagree uh, even I might disagree if I were to watch back season two again I haven't seen it for a while I've only seen it once but I think I prefer season three to season two because I think season 3 has more drive. Hear me out, season 1 had a great trajectory of Ted slowly succeeding in winning the squad and the club around to his philosophy whilst at the same time seeing the team itself decline into the league below. There's quite a clear opposite trajectories going on there at the same time in that season and I think that's brilliant. Season 2 though I think felt a little unsure of itself at times in that way. The club is relegated into the league below now and especially when they don't lose any of their players they should be expected to win promotion back up to the league above, or at the very least challenge for it. Richmond spend ages at the beginning just drawing all of their games, which is a horrifically bad performance. But there's not much a sense of pressure about it. You know, it's in season 3 where Higgins is raising the idea of should we fire Ted, <laughs> a season where they're expected to finish 20th and are overperforming. That should have been a scene happening in season 2, I think. We don't feel the pressure, we don't feel some kind of trajectory there, they're kind of just muddling about in the middle of goods and bads, no one's feeling much urgency or pressure, it all becomes a bit more on the sitcom side of things than sports drama. Until later into season 2 when it suddenly kicks into gear again. I might be wrong, I just can remember back when I did watch it feeling frustrated by season 2, the early on episodes. You could feel characters developing but you didn't feel like Richmond and the whole general premise of the club was that there was much development or trajectory there. Particularly when they chucked in a random Christmas episode which I think slowed things down even more. So coming back to season three, I think this general tension we get early on of will Richmond beat West Ham this season, I think that gives season three a little something more. You know, how is Nate gonna do in his job? How is he going to find redemption? Or will he at all? Will he go into a villain arc? How is this rivalry gonna play out between the two clubs and the two managers? How is everything going to um, resolve? And again, yes, how that ties into this central theme of letting go of rivalry in all order to grow rather than remaining chained to it out of an eagerness to defeat those that hurt you. It's such a good core to this season. But yeah, season 3 episode 2. Uh, we also get Keely this episode recognising all her colleagues are a bit uptight and they don't feel like much of a team. She asks Ted's advice about this, who suggests a work outing to help them bond, which I was then waiting to see happen. When's this work outing going to happen? But it, it never does. <laughs> I can't help 
wondering if that's a scene that was cut, or if the point was rather than Keely taking Ted's advice and doing something to help her team feel more connected, she instead derails into hiring an old friend in order to help Keely herself feel more connected, something that actually leaves her team divided and that was a mistake. Which is actually a really good plot point of Keely making that mistake. Um, I'm going to discuss Shandy now, uh, even though she's in later episodes. We're going to do the big Shandy discussion now. A lot of people seem to hate her and think she's absolutely pointless. I don't. I think this episode she serves a brilliant point, and then maybe a follow-up episode for Keely to learn from the mistake and to fire Shandy. I do think for Shandy to hang around until episode 5, however, does cause problems. That's a lot of screen time for her. So much of that could have been trimmed down and have Keely's arc progress a little quicker. I would have preferred less Shandy and more of Keely trying to bring her team together, learning from that mistake and now doing things like work outings, perhaps seeking more advice from Ted or Rebecca and you know, visibly seeing her grow as a leader off the back of that. The moment where she goes to tell Barbara off about how she talks to Shandy, only to realise the snow globes and have a small moment of connection, that was a beautiful moment. Possibly actually one of my highlights from this season, believe it or not. Keely is wonderful in that bit, and I think we needed more moments like that with other people in the office, if, you know, other office members had been given more personality. I think if there was a clearer sense of development there, of slowly learning how to pull a team together and build the sort of connection that she has been lacking in this office, that would have stopped a lot of people criticising her storyline for being pointless and a bit confusing. Possibly kill two birds with one stone there as well, because I think if Ted is chipping in a couple more times to offer a bit of advice, like a lot of people criticised Ted this season for not really being in it much, not having as much to do, and in a way that that is half the point Richmond doesn't need him by the end but I do think if he could have been a little bit of an anchor for Keely and say Sam in their own journeys of being bosses and then later on Nate as well someone they can kind of touch base with and draw from I think that would have helped make those separate storylines feel more connected again so I will say that Shandy absolutely has a good purpose in this season but it could have been delivered a bit tighter and trimmed down and moved on quicker um I I like the Zava stuff this episode. Rupert and Rebecca fighting over him like parents wanting custody of a child. <laughs> no, hang on, that, that's, that was an odd metaphor for me to use, wasn't it? <laughs> I, I liked Trent not being trusted by the team, particularly Roy because of how Trent hurt him when he was younger. That was great. So was Roy's talk at the end about being back at Chelsea and how it subtly hints a lot of the reasons he broke up with Keeley. Beautifully done. I love the way this episode ends. Roy opening up, not in a big dramatic way that leads to conflict or massive resolution and insight but just a person opening up about their feelings being heard and then saying goodnight with the music kicking in i think i think that just encapsulates what ted lasso is as a show and i love it I would give this episode a solid 8 out of 10 and yeah the central structure here of moving back and forth between rupert and rebecca is that really gives this episode a nice through line So I guess we can call this one the Zava episode. This is another thing I've seen a lot of criticism about. People saying Zava was completely pointless in the series and I 100% disagree. I think Zava is a great symbol for Rebecca's desire to beat Rupert. She wanted to sign him specifically because Rupert wanted to and ultimately that wasn't a good motivation for the club. Initially it went well with some good wins but ultimately Zava couldn't save the team. I think possibly had a negative effect in the long term and then him abruptly abandoning the team led them to feel even worse. There's a nice lesson there about doing what works well for the squad as a total team rather than just hiring some firepower. Zava is a great character because he is this kind of figurehead. He's a mercurial talent that gives the team hope and belief because as long as they've got him they can win. They sort of pour all their belief into Zava as an individual to save them rather than finding the belief within themselves and yes, like some sort of stimulant, it gives them an initial boost, but then leaves them feeling worse off. He is the total opposite to what Jamie becomes by the end of the season. Everyone has to feed Zava at the cost of their overall game, whereas Jamie becomes a playmaker that everyone goes through for the overall benefit of the team. Metaphorically, that is wonderful, you know? Zava also helps establish Rebecca and Rupert's rivalry. He is the catalyst for most of Jamie's development this season, the reason Jamie and Roy start to bond, and the reason Ted tearing up the believe sign comes to mean so much. 
Because with that believe sign, like with Zava, they don't need a symbol, a talisman to believe. They need to find it within themselves. Which I think, yeah, when they later reassembled a sign based on the bits each of them have kept for themselves, it's kind of an idea of that. This is no longer an external sign they're looking to to give them some belief. It's kind of a symbol that they've now built themselves out of their own inner belief. Does that make sense? Also, Zava is a really fun parody of Zlatan Ibrahimovic, um, who announced his retirement the other day. Oh, and here's another tangent while I remember. Um, I see a lot of people criticising this season for not being as funny as other ones. I bring that up basically just to say I'm not really the person to comment on that. I don't know, because this might shock some of you, but... In all honesty, despite how massive a fan I am of Ted Lasso, I've never found the show particularly funny. I don't know, I, I just haven't. You know, that's not to say I found the jokes cringeworthy or getting in the way of things, I didn't. I just kind of glossed over them with my interest absorbed in the story and the characters itself. So in that sense, I don't know if the comedy is any worse or not, because that side of it never appealed to me much anyway. I never paid too much attention to how well the comedy is delivered. Although I have always thought too many movie references. Someone starting to say something meaningful, some sort of pep talk type moment or giving advice, but then veering off into a tangent about movies that everybody then also chips in on, only to finally come back to the point that was being made. Three Kates. Yep. Yeah. Beckinsale, Hudson, Winslow. Yeah. yeah. And that gift of physical comedy is grossly underwritten. Look, point is, fellas. You suffered an unlikely and tragic coincidence. Not too dissimilar from those seen throughout Paul Thomas Anderson's 1999 Opus Magnolia. They do that kind of thing a hell of a lot throughout the show. It becomes a bit repetitive. Why is everyone a movie buff in this show as well? I don't know. Again, I don't mind that though. I just gloss over the humour because the story is what absorbs me. That's probably all I'm going to say about this episode. Um, apart from the fact Rebecca meets a psychic who tells her she's going to be a mum, mentions a green matchbook that we later see is from Sam's restaurant. Personally, I think using psychics for this kind of storyline is a bit of a cliche, although that's probably the point. They do like doing a lot of tributes to other tropes. Um, I was hoping the direction for this psychic storyline would be what Higgins says in episode 5. Even if some of them are charlatans, they can help us see something in ourselves that we can't quite see ourselves. He said that and I was like, oh, okay, that's an interesting idea to pursue. I can I can see something there, but no, <laughs> the psychic ultimately turns out to be 100% correct about everything. Really though, my point is this. I don't mind this whole plot of Rebecca becoming a mother. I think it's quite a good one, but I also don't know how essential it is to the season. You know, when I look at season three, I see a show with a lot of long episode runtime, and I see how many elements there are that probably deserved more breathing space and were a bit rushed, and it makes me wonder if they should have just cut all this Rebecca mother stuff. Cutting out that to make more space for Nate to have some scenes of coaching his players, or Keely to be building her team, or, or with Ted and Henry. There's just a lot they needed to fit into this season, and I think um, if we had to cut something, I think this stuff would be the most obvious choice. There are some complications, yes, I think you would have to adjust a few other things, but I think it could work to cut all of this out and leave Rebecca's arc more mostly focused on overcoming Rupert and coming to love being an owner of Richmond in her own right. You'd still need some sort of romance for her and things, but yeah, I think you could cut a lot of that out. Which reminds me of another tag. I'm gonna get this out of the way now and then we'll get back to discussing episodes. Someone told me somewhere in the comments that Bill Lawrence dropped out of the team for this season so he could instead work more closely on the show Shrinking. A show I plan to watch at some point so you might get videos about that, I don't know. But I do remember seeing an interview with Brett Goldstein and Jason Siegel about Shrinking where they praised Bill Lawrence for being a wizard when it comes to editing down the run times of shows. They said something like that he could cut like 30 minutes of runtime and they wouldn't even notice what had been taken out. He was that good at it. And both of those facts make me wonder if this season did miss the presence of Bill Lawrence. Just a little better editing to tighten everything up slightly more. Minor, minor tweaks that make such a big difference as a whole. Who knows? You know, we'll discuss this more later on because you might disagree that the show needed trimming, but that's certainly a good question to ask. This episode I think is a 7 or a 6 out of 10 for me on the basis of the psychic moments and Shandy being overplayed and okay yeah to be fair as important as Zava is maybe they could have trimmed down some of his comedy moments as well. Arguably they stretched that quite a bit that's my opinion. Um, on to episode 4.
I really like this one, 9 out of 10 for me. I said the tension around West Ham versus Richmond adds some much needed pace to this season and this is the explosion for it. Their Derby Showdown, a really really good episode exploring rage and how anger can be both destructive and constructive and how sometimes it's really hard to channel it well. I talked about that a lot in my analysis on episode 4. Um, in its exploration of all of that stuff, this episode is just perfect. It makes me smile just even thinking about how good a job they do there. Also the fun of everyone being caught up in this rivalry while Ted's mind is fixed on the idea of being a mess. It's good stuff here. The action of the match itself was well done too. Seeing Nate come close to apologising to Ted but then being drawn away, it's frustrating in a really nice way that. I probably would have given this episode 10 out of 10, however Shandy is overplayed again I think, and Jack Danvers introduction to this show, it's just a bit bland. There isn't a huge amount to her character here, her two things this episode are that she has a name that's typically male and that she has nice shoes, you know? <laughs> um, I would have liked some reason for us to you know, like Jack as a person. Or you could do the complete reverse and it can be a kind of us feeling the bad influence of Jack and worrying about Keely getting drawn in, but instead we kind of get neither. She's just a bit just a bit bland. Also as an aside, Derek in the restaurant so much reminds me of Ricky Gervais. I'm not sure why, he just does. I, I don't know if that's a compliment or a criticism, I just wanted to say it. So yeah, it could have been 10 out of 10, but I'm probably gonna give it nine. So now we learn Richmond are suddenly performing really badly. You know, in my episode 11 video I added up all the results of the season so far and I speculated what points Richmond were on by the end of the season. And I got it wrong and it was a bit annoying, but I've also noticed there's a continuity error here. Beard records their third loss of the season against Newcastle, but we then also directly see them lose to Man City and to Arsenal, which means at the very least they should have five losses this season, where in episode 12 of the table records them only having four so like unless one of those matches was a cup game which isn't suggested that is a bit confusing not that anybody cares it's just, it's just after going through all that episode to add up the points only to be wrong it makes me feel slightly vindicated if I can say yeah but there was a continuity error so to jump to Richmond performing suddenly quite badly anyway um that is a very sudden leap one I think makes sense with everything I said about what Zava symbolizes and it fits perfectly into the speech Ted delivers at the end of this episode. However, at the same time, some more slight explanation for how and why things have gone so wrong probably would have made it feel less like a sudden leap. I think they could have illustrated the point a little better that trying to feed Zava is actually hurting the overall team. It's there, it's probably just a bit too subtle, you know? Sometimes I think there is a difference between the positive of keeping things subtle and a bit ambiguous and leaving stuff to subtext and also the negative of a moment not fully landing with impact because it kind of it doesn't have that punch you know so yeah for me this episode is a mixed bag on the one hand we've got Ted's speech wonderful I love the way Trent looks on during this speech and you get a little feeling of excitement like oh Trent is gonna write about this in his book I feel so excited to see what he says not that we ever see anything that Trent writes that is a bit of a shame um, but there's that there's also Nate the Great State with Anastasia where he stands up for himself with the need of aggression. That's possibly being my favourite moment from the entire season as a whole. It is so good for all of the reasons I discussed in my episode 5 video. I adore this bit. At the same time though, this is an episode Shandy finally getting fired, but it's happened a bit too late I think. Keely and Jack's sudden romance blossoming out of that does feel a little sudden. Well, maybe not sudden actually, I just think we haven't seen enough chemistry between the two of them, and we don't know much about Jack as a character. It's hard to quite believe their romance. Also Rebecca's scenes with the doctor learning she is unable to become pregnant. You know, it, it's weird because I think this scene is a great scene. Beautifully delivered. I love this bit but at the same time, does it matter in the grand scheme of the story? And even if we are going to do a thing about the fact Rebecca can't get pregnant, do we need these long several scenes to illustrate that? Could it have been done in something much more concise? Probably. I think 
Basically what's holding me back on this episode is that the pacing is a bit slow and I wonder how much of that is down to scenes like this. Although, I don't know, maybe not. Pacing is one of those things that can be hard to really put your finger on. It's not until the second half of this episode that things really start to click though. So I think that's true, but again it contains my possibly favourite moment of the season so I'm going to give this an 8 out of 10. The Amsterdam episode. Um, this one is difficult to talk about because I think it's really, really hard to fault this episode. Whilst at the same time, what makes it so good is just how everything pulls together collectively. That makes it quite hard to break down and discuss, you know? An episode like this was really needed at this exact moment in the season. Everybody to get out of their heads on a trip to another country and find uh, inspiration again, passion, find their flow, I suppose. There's a lot to love here especially the way it introduces Total Football and has Ted finally get to prove himself tactically, finally. I don't know if the episode merits an hour runtime, but it's also the kind of episode where you can forgive that, because how kind of outside the ordinary show this episode feels, that kind of gives it a feeling of being like a standalone movie, so in that sense, yeah, the runtime works. It's a great tribute to Ajax, to Total Football, to Van Gogh, to Chet Baker, which uh, someone helpfully pointed out in the comments, jazz is to music, what total football is to football. Admittedly, I feel a bit different about the scenes of Coach Beard trying to get drugs for Ted and then going off on his own, now that we've had the revelation about Beard's drug-involved past. I also don't know if Rebecca's romance this episode needed quite so much runtime. I absolutely think it's important, despite everything I said about possibly cutting down or removing the mother storyline. Um, minor criticisms though, this is really solid stuff here, a really fulfilling scene also with Trent and Colin. I think in general they did a great job with Trent this season, he was a character that they knew needed to go somewhere and they had to have a think about where they could slot him in and having him write a book about Richmond and also kind of support Colin, it's the perfect place to nestle a minor but well liked character into the season. I just wish we got to read some of the book. Only other thing I'll say that doesn't directly apply to to this episode but is worth saying somewhere in this video. All of the scenes of Roy mentoring Jamie. I said in one of my videos, and a hell of a lot of you disagreed with me, I said Roy mentoring Jamie would be better if they weren't just doing exercise, just running or cycling all of the time. That it would have been more impactful if Jamie was learning something tactical or improving a technical part of his game that would feed into becoming the playmaker he does for the team. And a lot of you said he doesn't need to learn that because he was already coached by Pep Guardiola at Man City who is all about that stuff and I just think yes true but still doing lots of physical exercise isn't that fulfilling. For one I reckon the physio might be horrified with some of it, the sheer amount of physical exercise footballers already do with lots of sharp turns and agile movements means it is very easy for players to become injured. Too much running should be something to be a bit careful about, but also at no point is running a lot highlighted as a key part of Jamie's game. I think it is a key part to be clear, but there's no moment where we see on the pitch Jamie outrunning the opposition team that are getting really tired and we go, wow, all this training has really paid off, this has helped them win the game kind of stuff. The closest thing we get to pay off is when Ted has the whole team do physical exercise and Jamie does really well at it, but I just think they could have gone a step further made all of this extra training land more than it does. And also, we now know Roy ends this season as the next manager, so let him prove his worth as a manager. Let him teach Jamie things, not just make him run. Show that yes, while Nate is the main tactical brain, Roy's experience as a player still means there's a lot he can teach Jamie and help him improve at. It's minor, but I do think they missed a trick there. All the same, this episode is a 9 out of 10 for me. I don't know what I think about this episode. I think this is where some of the season is getting a bit messy, perhaps. There's, there's kind of too much. I mean, I've, I've said there's an interesting arc in Keeley's story of setting up this new firm, trying to win her team round, making a mistake with Shandy because she felt disconnected and a bit lonely on her own. Then she makes a similar mistake with Jack, 
possibly for similar motivations. I don't know, it's not all the clever clear why they start dating. But that stuff does leave you a little confused about the trajectory of Keeley's arc. In premise, in, in theory, it's definitely there. She learns one lesson from the experience with her friend Shandy. She learns another lesson from her partner Jack. And then finally, on the third attempt, she pulls it together with her colleague Barbara and provides a way forwards where Keeley is now running the business the way she wants to. I do think it works, it's just not quite executed perfectly. As is probably evidenced by so many people getting confused about it, thinking it's all pointless, hating Keeley this season, all of that stuff. Like, I think they're wrong to feel that, but I can fully understand why they feel that way, you know? A little better tightness in the story would have cleared up a lot of confusion. But as it is, Keeley's arc in this point feels a little too crams in. And perhaps that's something we can criticise the Amsterdam episode for. Choosing not to show any of the characters who aren't in Amsterdam for that episode, Keely and Nate. That decision makes perfect sense, it makes that episode itself work really well, but it also means both her and Nate's stories now have to play catch up because they've lost an entire episode, you know? I think the love bombing stuff is all quite good though. I love this whole story of Nate creating this fancy gift for Jade the way his father did for his mum, only to drop it in the road and leave it there because it does not matter. The gift isn't important and possibly a bit creepy. Be your awkward clumsy self. He literally falls over in the middle of asking Jade out and yeah I, I like that. You could argue it's sad that Nate doesn't get to be more smooth which let's remember he was actually very smooth with Anastasia but I personally think it's nice to see awkwardness not played up as a pathetic personality trait. Not making Nate pathetic off the back of that but also not quite being idealised as super adorable either. Just kind of being a side of Nate. It's fine, sometimes he's a bit awkward, that's part of who he is. Also we see Nate not spitting in the mirror, um, perfection, I don't need to say anything more about that. All of Nate's scenes are brilliant this episode, but again it does feel like we've missed something. Very much like we have skipped an episode for Nate, because what about all of the non-Jade related growth that he has to do? What is he like as a coach? What is he learning there? Actually yeah, while the Amsterdam episode Judging it as a standalone piece is wonderful. The effect missing a whole episode has on Nate and Keeley, um, for that I think we should knock down the Amsterdam score to 8 out of 10 instead of 9. There's also Sam this episode, a character I didn't discuss in my video on episode 7 because I thought we were going to get more of his story at the restaurant. I thought I'd have a chance later in the season to discuss it more, but we kind of we kind of don't. All that's left of Sam's restaurant after this episode is Akufu popping up to announce that he's opening a rival restaurant that we then don't learn anything more about. So yeah, that, that's a shame. Also not a disaster because I don't think Sam is quite as main a character as Keely or Nate. So we more have to judge Sam's story here as a standalone one for this episode and I like this arc. I like how quite well it unintentionally parallels the recent Gary Lineker situation where he was temporarily suspended from presenting Match of the Day because he criticised the government's migration policy. It's very similar to Sam. At the same time, which was probably more the influence when they were writing, it reminded me of Marcus Rashford's efforts to basically make sure children got to eat food. I won't dive into all of that if you're not familiar because it's only vaguely relevant to what I'm saying, but Manchester United footballer Marcus Rashford used his influence to try and make sure the government fed children from low-income families with free school meals. A lot of people attacked him for it, which seems an odd thing to attack. I don't know, it's, it's that footballers should stick to football argument that people always make. They're allowed to donate vast wealth to charities, which, to be clear, a lot of footballers do donate surprising amounts. If they do that for charity, it's seen as a real big positive, but if they recognise that their own wealth and influence isn't enough to fix something that the government might be capable of fixing, that the government is supposed to handle, and then they argue the case for the government to do more, suddenly they should shut up and stick to sport. As it all relates to this show though, I think it's a nice arc of someone attempting to support a cause they care about and being attacked for it. Sam's dad is just the best. He's that kind of character you'd love to see more of but also recognise it's best to probably keep him brief. So much of this show has been about working through difficulties with fathers, so it's nice to see a good dad being a good dad as well. Is the political stuff a bit straightforward? Yeah, it is. They just launch straight into this from 
from a character that's barely established elsewise just complaining about the migration policy. I'm certain there will be people calling this ham-fisted and they'll say it's a forced agenda and it's woke and all of that stuff everybody says whenever there's something politically they disagree with. And yeah, in, in this instance they are probably right, it is a bit ham-fisted. I don't know why that's something to get super angry about and to decide it's part of some big woke conspiracy and an attack on our culture, you, you know, no, it's, it's just a slightly ham-fisted inclusion of a political problem that is a vehicle to explore celebrities having to cope with public condemnation and vandalism aimed at him. It's a vehicle to allow the players to come together in quite an organic way. Sure, it's not very subtle, sure, it's the writers expressing an opinion, but why is that something to be massively offended by? Why? Art has always explored different political ideas and places. Art has always included story elements that aren't the most subtle and can be a bit ham-fisted. You can criticise that as an element of writing, but it's always a good question to ask, is it worth me being this angry about it? That's generally a point we can say for the Colin episode as well. Um, anyway, this is the episode where Total Football comes together and I adore that. As I said before, it's ridiculously unrealistic A, to master Total Football so quickly and B, for what is now quite an old tactic that people have tweaked and developed differently since then, for it to work so effectively. That's unrealistic too, but I don't care. Um, this tends to be my rule for realism. A rule probably with a billion exceptions. My rule is that I will very very happily overlook something unrealistic if it is in service of the artistic, I suppose. If it's good for thematic or metaphorical reasons, you know, I'm more interested in that than the realism. I think all of the stuff in this episode is perfect. <laughs> I think it's a peak moment for Jamie. You get a very excited Trent again where you're left feeling I am so keen to know what he writes about this in his book. It's also just really good to see training scenes again, to see some coaching happening. I especially love the idea to open it up for fans to come and watch. I think that suits a lot of what Richmond symbolises in this show. I just, yeah, you know what's bothering me. It's the whole dicks tied with string stuff. Look, I know a lot of you don't mind this and probably found it quite funny and I I don't blame you. Even speaking as someone who's never found this show amusing, I can exactly see why this whole bit is funny. Roy's delivery of this line is on point. Next time we do this drill, we tie multiple guys dicks to one guy's dick. Yeah? But in general, is it so great a joke that it's worth A, forcing Roy to be out of character over, and B, surely there are some serious HR complaints there. This is the exact same episode where Trent lords Ted for creating a culture of trust and understanding and emotional maturity, and here they are being put through the humiliating, possibly physically damaging, arguably this is harassment or assault. It's all just the total opposite to what Ted's supposed to have done for Richmond as a culture, you know? It's more the kind of thing you'd imagine stock Mr. Outdated Manager George Cartrick doing, not here. Look, it's not the end of the world, it's just a minor throwaway joke, but I do think it's in bad taste that it goes against the themes of the show and that it forces Roy to be out of character. He's always been a bit gruff and a bit firm, but taking sadistic pleasure in this stuff. It's the same as his long advice on how to handle bullies. And then you start to beat them again. Another minor throwaway joke where I can see exactly why people find this funny, but this isn't Roy Kent. This isn't how he behaves. When I asked for all your thoughts on this season, several of you suggested that Roy has been flanderized, and I see where you're coming from. And because it's relevant to what I've just said actually, I'm going to also mention George Cartrick's balls being flashed in episode 12. I'll mention that now. Um, I criticised that in my episode 12 video and a lot of you were quick to point out that it's a callback to season 1 episode 1 where Rebecca says this to George. Or maybe it's because you insist on wearing those tiny shorts that force me to see one of your testicles. Yes, I was aware it is indeed a callback, but they'd already called back to this moment earlier in episode 12 with a decent visual gag. Yes boss. We have to acknowledge- So A, there's no need to call back to it again, and B, like the dick string scene, is it so good a joke that we really need it, that we can't just cut it? Criticising two or three jokes <laughs> across an entire show is hardly much. It's, it's a joke, it doesn't matter, uh, but it is quite outdated in a show that's supposed to be all about progressive and empathetic understanding of people. Someone being exposed for everyone else to laugh at. Why are we laughing when Keeley was exposed this season? You know, it, it 
it shouldn't be something to laugh at. And there have been arguments I've seen people make that it's okay because George chooses to wear those shorts, that it's implied he somewhat likes his balls being seen, or that he deserves it because it's kind of outdated behaviour he puts onto other people. Personally, I don't think that means he deserves this. I think if they wrote the character to like having his balls exposed, then that seems an odd characteristic to write for a person. That's a bit strange, isn't it? Would it be fine for a live camera to be looking up a woman's skirt with the argument she probably secretly enjoys it? That's something you expect from a comedy made in the 60s, not 2023. Doesn't matter, does anyone really care? Should I have devoted so much time to discussing something that is literally a several seconds joke? No. <laughs> um, I just wanted to explain my reasoning because I got so many comments about it, but now we're moving on. It's very minor. I'm giving episode 7 probably a 7 out of 10. I think it's a mixed bag with a few brilliant moments. So this episode has another slight time jump for Richmond to have won several games in a row. This time jump I don't mind, I think the montage is well delivered, I think breezing through four wins when we've seen the spark for their success already in the last episode. We saw the team starting to click. You know, when people criticise all of the time jumps, I think this one works fine. Especially how smoothly it transitions into a sad Ted sitting with Jake and Michelle. Also having mentioned George, I just generally love him as a pundit all throughout the show. He's so blatantly changing his mind over everything to be critical. When Richmond are doing well early on, he's saying it's just lucky and that what Nate Shelley is doing is the real success. Then when Nate resigns, he's saying Nate never deserves to be a manager, he was just my kit man. Rupert Mannion is the brains behind West Ham. Yeah, pundits sometimes are exactly like that. Put my chest out at half time and I said, I hate pundits. Paul Pogba. I said the guy is a disgrace oh, to football. Pogba? Anyway, episode 8 is one I really enjoyed when I watched it, but flicking through it now, I'm not sure I can objectively score it higher than 7 out of 10, because I feel like for where this is in the season, episode 8 out of 12, it should be pulling more weight than it does. I really like the decision to explore the leaked nudes, I think they handle that with a lot of maturity and humanity. The direct call to arms for people to delete their nudes felt again a bit ham-fisted, but that scene with Jamie at the end was wonderful and it shows you just how much he has grown as a person. Jamie without doubt has the best, most satisfying arc out of anyone across the entire show. So much so that it's a real shame they undercut this great moment here by having him in episode 12 tell Roy that the leaked nude was sent to him as some pathetic bragging rights in their argument over who gets the girl. The more I think about this scene, the less I like it. But the more I think about this scene, the more I love it. <laughs> Especially how well it contrasts with Roy here. Anyway, what else is going on this episode? Um, Nate has an arc of wanting to be in a relationship with Jade and then being in a relationship with Jade, which is quite nice. I like how it's delivered, I like getting to see Nate smile. I think, um, yeah, we're being made very clear now that Nate no longer obsesses over online posts of himself, but about Richmond. That's good, although again, I'd like some more exploration as for how he made that change. All of that is really good stuff, but generally, for episode 8 out of 12, more needs to be happening here for Nate, I think. This is not enough legwork on its own. I'm fully on board with where Nate's arc goes, it's the thing I was most excited about after season 2 ended. I wasn't just excited though because it'll be nice to see him redeemed, I was also excited because there's so much depth to explore within that journey of growth. So much depth that kind of gets skirted over. They could have gone so much further, you know? And, and yes, I think redemption feels more fulfilling when you've properly gone through the redemption. Also this episode, Ted is worried that Jake is going to propose to Michelle. All of it is left ambiguous, but especially having seen episode 12, I feel like Jake did propose and Michelle turned him down. They do a good job with this plot point, I think. The idea of Ted getting more caught up in Jake and Michelle at the cost of spending proper time with his son. That's it's nice. The bit where Ted tries to quiz Henry about Jake is like, <laughs> don't do it Ted, don't put your son in the middle of a rivalry, don't do that to him. And luckily Henry falls asleep and I think Ted realises his error, all of that is good. But, but you know what I'm going to say, their ex-couples therapist in a relationship with Michelle, it's so unethical. And I don't think one quick line from Sassy about it. Wow, that's borderline unethical. Yeah, well, I mean it all started it year and a half after we were seeing them, so I guess that's... ...is enough to address that fact, it's just not. 
I feel like they wrote themselves into a corner over Jake. They wanted a reason, A, for Ted to actually express his anger towards Michelle rather than bottling it up. They needed him to make that development as he did in episode 4 and I praised that moment and hoped, expected more was going to follow. But also B, a reason for Ted this episode to be more caught up in their relationship than in actually spending time with Henry. Both of those are good beats they need to hit this season, so if we make Michelle's new boyfriends their ex-therapist that'll really punch Ted in the nuts, that'll really force him to show some anger. No, <laughs> you don't need to do that to get him angry, because now what it means is you've got this massively unethical therapist that is never properly addressed or resolved and it just opens a box of so many complications. So many that especially for a minor character they're just not going to have time to explore. Mostly this episode is Ted and Henry as well as Jack and Keeley centred. Jack leaves Keeley in a scene I think is pretty strong. I like their story this episode but I guess I just feel Jack has always been a bit bland and we all knew they were going to break up. We all knew this wasn't going going to last, and that takes away from a lot of the drama here. It seems like a lot of people's reaction to this was, good, that gets Jack out of the way, now we can get back to Keeley getting on with things again. <laughs> and that is not an ideal reaction to have when a beloved character is dumped in a really horrible way. So again, I don't have any issues with the ideas here, there's just not quite the execution to make it as impactful as it deserves to be. So on that basis, on the Ted and Michelle complication, on the fact I think more legwork needs to be happening at this point in the season, I'm going to give this one a 7 out of 10. Oh my god, I completely forgot to mention that Colin last episode, Isaac found out he was gay. That was great. I massively respect how they left that hanging for an entire episode until now. Really good decision. Now we get an episode mostly centred on them too. Here's a question though, um, and it is a question because there's a both good and bad here and I'm not sure where my thoughts land. I said what gave a lot of the early episodes some drive was this underlying tension between Nate and Ted, between Rupert and Rebecca. I said that and what I also said was I adore how they kind of subvert that tension and reach a place where the rivalry doesn't matter anymore, where it's not about defeating your enemies but moving on. I said that was a beautiful story arc, however at the same time the way that rivalry and that tension just sort of peters out across the season means we do lose a level of drive and drama by this point. It means we end up with Ted somewhat taking a back seat and Nate's story becoming not much about West Ham at all anymore. We get a moment of him leaving Rupert at the club to go home to Jade, a solid moment, but when it's followed by suddenly discovering that Nate has resigned, <laughs> I'm not sure this moment is enough. The point is, a lot of that tension has gone and it leaves these episodes feeling slightly aimless. Episodes 7 felt like a Sam episode, 8 a Keeley episode, 9 a Colin and Isaac episode, rather than being free ensemble episodes well connected to a central developing arc. Is that fair? I don't know. That's my question. Um, I think this West Ham versus Richmond was a core idea that anchored most things, and without it you feel like something is missing in these episodes, despite each of their individual elements being really good. I would have said the rivalry between Rupert and Rebecca also petered out, but as it happens that doesn't at all. That gets another of my favourite moments in the next episode when Rebecca and Rupert go to Edwin's Super League meeting and it's a perfect conclusion to their rivalry. I adore that scene and if that works so well it does make me wonder, are we missing something between Nate and Ted? Should there still be a tension between them right now? Not a rivalry but a, you know, maybe a sense of Nate being fearful what Ted thinks of him afraid to apologise to him. Or Ted worried about Nate, worried about when he resigns and why that happens and if Nate's doing okay. Some underlying feeling between these two characters that keeps them somewhat connected and it can carry through and build up into the perfect crescendo of Nate finally apologising. Is that what feels missing? Is that why despite loving most of the elements this episode, some less conscious part of me just intuitively wants to say this episode is 7 out of 10 rather than anything higher? I don't know, perhaps it's not that, perhaps something else is nagging at the back of my brain. I'm genuinely keen to know what people think here because I, I haven't figured it out. 
You know something no one has celebrated enough this series? It's the friendship between Jamie and Sam. I love it. Especially when Jamie wears the number 24 shirt, but also last episode actually, where they joke with each other about who gets to be captain. Then Jamie interrupts Sam's speech. It's so wholesome and warm. This though is the Super League International Break episode. It's one where the show leans more into sentimentality, for which I think yeah, fair enough if you're critical for that, but for me, for what this episode is, for what this show is, I think the sentimentality works here. It feels like a heartfelt celebration of fans and what football truly means. And it's a great episode about getting back to our roots, either to remember what's important, or in order to let go of the past. I talked about that in my video on this episode, and it's just this show at its absolute best, I think, when it's very intricately exploring a theme across the entire episode through all of the characters. I was going to give this episode 9 out of 10 until I realised I've not given anything 10 out of 10, and yeah, this is probably my favourite episode, so why the hell not? This can be 10 out of 10. Rebecca's story here with Rupert is, okay, maybe that's my favourite thing from the whole season. Maybe this is the best bit. I could not be more passionate about this. It's perfect. Not to say the episode as a whole is perfect, there are still some problems. For one, Ted's not really doing much. Episode 10 out of 12 now, more needs to be happening for him so that he can wrap up well by episode 12. I think you could very easily have Ted concerned about why Nate resigned and trying to reach out to offer Nate support and how conflicted Nate might feel about that offer. Again, just something to connect the two characters up. I love Roy's letter to Keeley, even if I don't much like him hooking up with her. It makes it doubly confusing confusing actually because it leaves you thinking they're together again except then they're not. I think Keeley's crash with the board cutting her funding then her kind of uniting with Barbara is a good arc. In fact, Barbara is possibly my favourite character this season. I love Keely hugging her and Barbara's awkwardness about the hug, not being overplayed as some dramatic stereotype, nor being something about Barbara being cold and that she needs to learn to get over it. No, it, it's just she's quite awkward about hugs and that's fine. That's Barbara. There's nothing wrong with it. I said in a Patreon article recently that I don't know how realistic this would be, but that I think I'd rather Rebecca didn't just bail Keeley out over the lack of funding. That I'd rather if Keeley found her own, admittedly smaller funding to survive on. I don't know how realistic that is, but really I think what we're missing, either here or in a later episode, is some moment of Keeley going, okay, KJPR hasn't quite worked so far, I've made several mistakes and almost gone under, but I've learned from all of that now, I know the direction to take things in now. Just some moment that shows her really pushing forwards in her own way again. You know like Ted has his total football epiphany. Some minor version of that for Keeley. Something that stops it feeling like Keeley has simply survived this crash and managed to maintain the business and feeling more like there's growth to come out of it. Also, Sam Richardson is going all in on the cartoon villain portrayal of Edwin, and it is so fun. He does a great job with what he was asked to do. It's just a shame none of it gets resolved and goes anywhere. I think for the show to just subtly mention actually Edwin didn't open this rival restaurant next to Sam, and that National Outcry got Sam back into the Nigeria squad. Something they didn't even mention is just what Brendan Hunt said in a Reddit AMA. That happening and Edwin Akufu just moved on to other things. I don't feel like just mentioning that in the background is enough. I'd have liked some slight moment both to humanise Edwin in a later episode, even if he is still very much a villain. I think that's fine for him to be a villain. That's and also some moment to celebrate a national outcry bringing Sam back into the squad. That could have been a really positive touching moment for Sam that is also an example for how, yes, the public can still have some power against awful billionaires. I would like to see a scene like that, but it would be a scene that would happen later on in the series, not episode 10. Um, episode 10 itself does a great, great job. As sudden as Nate just resigning was, everything that happens for him in this episode is brilliant. The violin, the scene with his dad, I love it. You later see them playing cards all happily, and my interpretation was that it's all meant to say this is the start of repairing their relationship. One apology doesn't solve everything, there's still a road to go, and I thought they were going to emphasise that again later in the season to make it very clear. They're on the right road, but it takes time. And that was the criticism I made in episode 12 
12. Not that Nate's dad or even Jamie's didn't deserve redemption. My criticism was that they made it look all rosy and happily resolved when that's not what it should look like, and I don't think even what they were intending to say. There's more that's supposed to come in their journeys, it just doesn't quite look like it. But yeah, this is my favourite episode. Only other thing to say, they forced Danny out of character for the sake of that joke about him being a different person in international games. So on the back of that, I was glad in episode 12 when Danny at least acknowledged this by gifting the Zorro mask as an apology. Yeah, 10 out of 10, now on to episode 11. You know something I really like about this episode? Ted's mum asks him if he's still having panic attacks and he says, No, no. Uh, not recently. And then later on we get an ever so slight one in the hotel room, happening after looking at a text from his mum, I think suggesting Ted needs to talk to his mum, but unlike the panic attack from episode 5 where the camera puts all focus on it, and it's this big moment and we very gradually see Ted able to bring himself down, this time it's not given total focus, it's not such a big moment. We hear the ringing and then the camera kind of just transitions from this into the match. And I quite like that. Are you still having panic attacks? No, not recently, not as much, or at least not too bad, you know? They still come from time to time, but I'm doing okay. It, it, it isn't that kind of yeah, I'm cured type attitude people sometimes have towards mental health issues, but that it's a journey, that it's it's not perfect, but Ted is doing well. Unless I'm being an idiot and forgetting something in the final episode, I think this is the last we hear about his panic attacks, and I think that's just a great way to end this. It's exactly one of those things that doesn't have to be perfectly resolved. Anyway, this is another really strong episode. Ted's mum is great. Ted's being able to express both gratitude and anger, love and rage, see the good and the bad both together is beautiful. Perfect character development, exactly what he needs, I could not praise it any higher. And Jamie's story this episode, his conflicted feelings about his dad, how actually scary and confusing and like a whirlwind it is to realise that he isn't as angry at his dad as he used to be anymore. The shot of Jamie's dad is so damn powerful as well, another one of my favourite moments. Internally, I think we see Jamie grappling with the idea of trying to forgive his dad. He hasn't done it yet, but he's trying to. That's nice. Does that mean I think it's good he messages his dad's? I don't know. I think that has to be my answer. We don't know, because we haven't seen enough of James Tart to know where he is, what he feels, if he's changed. He's certainly in rehab, and that's a good sign, but is he really growing and reflecting on his old behaviour towards Jamie? We just don't know. Again, I think the message here and in episode 12 is supposed to be that they're at the beginning of a very difficult journey to repair their relationship. And that's a really good point to express, I just don't think the show has expressed it well. Having Jamie text him out of the blue without seeing anything much to suggest James's feelings, and just having this rosy no dialogue shot of both of them as part of a montage of lots of other idealised happy moments, that makes it look like, yeah, less like this is the start of a long complicated journey, and more like it's the end of a simple one. So that's just a slight issue with how they execute those scenes, how it implies something they weren't meaning to imply. All the same, Jamie's general struggle this episode is another of the series highlights. I think it's just the best. Um, same with Coach Beard forgiving Nate. All of these are stellar moments in the series for which I could easily score this episode 10 out of 10, but, but I'm not going to because Colin, Will and Isaac abruptly asking Nate to come back means we miss out on an important beat. I don't want to come across too repetitive here, I'm going to try and explain this concisely. After Nate's apology letter to Will, I can perfectly believe Will reaching out to try and get Nate to come back. However, in a series that has been exploring forgiveness, true deeper forgiveness, that isn't just choosing to paper over the cracks and act like you don't care anymore when deep down something might still be bothering you. And in a show that has emphasised the importance of expressing anger in constructive, loving ways, to miss the step where that kind of thing happens with Will and Nate, or Ted and Nate, or Colin and Nate, that 
beat in the story matters significantly. So yeah, it's not just that it affects the pacing of this series, it also matters in a thematic meaningful sense. I'm going to tell you what I think I would have done to have tweaked this in a moment, but first I'm going to score this episode. It, it's either an 8 or a 9 out of 10, depending on how hard I want to be on that missed beat. Also I love that this episode ends on Ted about to say that he's leaving. I think that's a great way to end this episode. Uh, so yeah, fine, I'll give it 9 out of 10, fine. So let's ignore the points total not making perfect sense. Let's celebrate the return of the catchphrase. Oh, shut up, dear Henry. By the way, I've been recording for two hours now. My throat is starting to sound really strained, isn't it? I think this whole thing of all of them waking up at Rebecca's is a weird way to start this episode. There's, there's nothing wrong in it. It's not a criticism. It's just a bit odd. It's a chance, a rare chance, to see Coach Beard and Jane together. And it makes me wonder... What the hell are we supposed to think about Coach Beard and Jane? This episode has them getting married in a super idealistic setting. We also have what I think is the reverse rom-com trope of the protagonist stopping their lover from boarding a plane to tell them that they love them. Here it's instead the lover who has boarded the plane exiting it to confess their love. I assume that's why they had Beard leave now and not like earlier on at a convenient point in time. All of that though paints the picture of a happy couple who are deeply in love and I'm not certain that adds up with what we've seen throughout the rest of the show. I don't know, like admittedly I can't remember a lot from the last two seasons, but are they good together? Most of what we see this season is either Beard just telling us he loves her without being shown any scenes to see and feel their love, or it's jokes about their sex life, or it's Jane doing things like shredding his passport, which doesn't feel great and leaves me a bit confused. Does it merit such a sunny wedding scene? Also, Ted didn't go to their wedding, so maybe that's an indication of what he thinks of Jane. <laughs> no, I'm joking there. Um, but you can see how confusing and odd this relationship is. I needed to mention that somewhere. I think I've already mentioned that Roy and Jamie's punch-up bothers me. I kind of half forgived it when I saw it, because it felt like a way of trying to say, yes, people still aren't perfect, they still make mistakes sometimes and mess up, and I think that's a good point to make, but I don't know if this is the way to make it, because it doesn't feel fair for their characters. I'd rather have just had a scene where Roy attempts to ask Keeley out in quite a touching way, if that is even still on his mind, and Keeley can quite compassionately, lovingly say no, and it can leave the tiniest space in that conversation to hint more clearly at why they broke up before and why Keeley doesn't want to drop back into any of that. You know, I, I think this show has done a great job throughout refusing to play up to the love triangle trope, and I feel like the best way to do that for the final episode is to not really Really mention it at all. I do still think this episode sticks to landing though. I think it is a solid job that's very moving in places and provides a satisfying ending. In a world of shows with terrible endings, this is one to appreciate. Something I didn't mention in my episode 12 video, something I didn't actually consider until people started commenting it. Ted's not showing much emotion this episode. I don't know, I've, I've seen various interpretations about that. Either that Ted isn't sad to leave them and it comes across a bit heartless and careless, or that he's sad at the end because going home feels a little shallow having made such a wonderful home in England. I think it's a fair point to say he never seems that sad. I, I think they, it could have been nice to see him get a bit teary saying goodbye at points. I, I get that. But I don't think what they were going for is to make him look heartless. I think it's to say that Ted feels confident in what he's doing here. I think they were afraid having him too teary would make it feel like him leaving was a bad thing when it's not. This is a triumph for him. In in fact, I even think what makes the goodbye between him and Rebecca powerful is that you see both of them trying not to cry. I think actually crying would have kind of undermined that. And that other interpretation there, um, people questioning does he really want to go back home? That isn't the point after all these seasons of Ted putting everybody else first, seeing to their needs, finally he's supposed to be doing something for himself, which is to put his son first over himself? That feels confusing. Surely what he'd want for himself is to stay in Richmond and have Henry come there with him. I, I, again, I get that interpretation. I don't think I agree, but I think we could have done with more to emphasize that yes, Ted himself 
also wants to go home. Not just out of guilt for his son missing him, and not even because he just misses Henry, but that it feels like the right time to go home. We get hints of this, Ted wanting to eat at an American diner when they're in Amsterdam, or all of the Wizard of Oz, there's no place like home references. There are hints of this, but it never does feel more than just hints, so I get that. I get why people feel like Ted might not be happy going home, even though he definitely is. Um, I also get people feel a bit sad to see an accomplished, successful Premier League manager just end up coaching a junior team, but uh, like I said before, that is precisely the point. He wants to be close to his son. The reason he wanted to win the Premier League trophy was to make his son proud and to make good on his promise to Rebecca. Doing something for himself means not chasing the winning and the success. Doing something for himself means not having half his mind caught up in managing all of Richmond anymore. It means spending all of his time as much as he can with his son. Sure, he could have stayed in England and had Henry come over to live there with him, have left his job at Richmond to take a different junior coaching job there that, so that he can spend more time with his son, sure, but that also means uprooting Henry's entire life. And what's the point in staying in England if he's not going to be still a part of Richmond, you know? It's just a lot less complicated for him to move back to the US. So I think that's my thoughts there. I understand people's confusion, but I still think it works and I like it. Another point, um, one I'm not going to say much on because I discussed it in detail in my video in episode 12, but I stand by my opinion that they've gone a step back this episode by making Rupert the cartoonish villain. Rupert was the cartoonish villain throughout a lot of this series. Then they humanised him as part of Rebecca truly learning to let go in a wonderfully liberating, empowering moment for her. Such a great moment, and then now he's suddenly the cartoon villain again? Just so we can get a moment to laugh at him having comeuppance? Look, I expressed it kind of badly in that video. I was not saying Rupert deserves redemption. Like, sure, that would be nice, but there's been nothing at all in his character to at any point suggest he has changed or that he might do with time. All that's happened is he's caused his own downfall through his actions, and he doesn't doesn't seem to have learned from them. Redemption would not make sense, even if I was querying has James Tart done anything more than Rupert to suggest he is learning and growing. So yes, my point isn't redemption, my point is why do we need to make a laughing stock out of him when the whole point of Rebecca's arc was that she doesn't care, that she's moved on from him. They've already made it perfectly clear that Rupert is in the middle of a downfall, why do they need to then go and devote so much extra screen time just to ridicule? him. There is a reason, um, as some of you pointed out, it's that the public get to see him for who he truly is now, uh, a wanker basically. <laughs> that is a fair argument. The whole show began with the general public loving Rupert, um, so I get that, however I think indulging in a chance to make it so very obvious that people see him for who he truly is, when again they'd already hinted that just fine. Bex and the personal assistant seeing Rupert for who he is, Gary Lineker talking about it, I think we've done that job already, and then going the extra step to indulge in it puts the audience at a distance to Rebecca's perspective, and therefore it detracts from her growth, because suddenly, although she or Ted aren't taking pleasure in Rupert's comeuppance here, we as the audience are, the camera is. I think that's an absolutely fair criticism on my part, I stand by it. Um, if they really needed a moment of villain comeuppance, make it Edwin. He's not being humanised, he's still the straight up villain by the end of this story. Have the national outcry about Sam being cut from the Nigeria squad, have that lead to some moment of serving him comeuppance. Rupert I think is more impactful if we just don't see him this episode, if we've moved on. Which is where we now come to what I would change to make this season better. In my opinion. Um, <laughs> are you ready? I completely forgot to rank episode 12, um, I'm giving it a 6 out of 10, it's still good, but I think the pressure of trying to wrap up the show makes this episode probably the hardest of the season to write, and yeah, I, I think that shows. So keep in mind this is just my opinion. This is one of those things where it might sound great in my brain when I 
stopped to think about this for a good five minutes, but if I sat down to actually write this thing as a script and think it through more clearly, I might suddenly realise there's a hell of a lot of flaws to my suggestion that I hadn't considered. So yeah, keep that in mind. This is more a thing to do because it's fun and interesting rather than me going, look how much better I could do with the writing because I couldn't. I think take this final game of West Ham versus Richmond and make it happen earlier in the story. Either during episode nine, you make the game Colin comes out to his teammates, West Ham versus Richmond, or probably a better solution, have an extra episode between that one and the international break episode. Add in a new episode there where they play West Ham. At that point, Nate is still the manager but let's say a couple of recent performances have gone against them and it have left Rupert being quite hard, very demanding and pressurizing and a bit intimidating and cruel towards Nate, much like Nate's dad used to be. That pressure contrasts with a side of Nate that actually feels quite excited to play Richmond again and possibly get a proper chance to apologize to Ted this time, like he did attempt before but kind of messed up. This time he's keen to correct that. And also thinking of Ted, Nate recognizing how good a motivator Ted was. West Ham could do with that kind of thing right now, his players are a bit demotivated by their current blip in form, so Nate thinks to try something they once did at Richmond, this might help the West Ham players. Way back in season 1, Nate wrote down all his thoughts on paper about the players and then before the game, told them each what he thought of them in a kind of roast scene that was half for laughs. That worked back then didn't it, to help motivate the team, so maybe I can do that now. So Nate tries that again, but like who Nate was at the beginning of this series, like he was to Will or Colin in season two, Nate is a little bit cruel in the roast. Players are left genuinely hurt and demotivated by the roast. And this extra point might be a step too far, in which case you would cut it, but one player could start to argue back against this roast, against the criticisms being made of him. What about this thing I did in the last game? What about all these goals I've scored or whatever? Aren't you going to praise me for that stuff? To which Nate, now getting caught up in this argument and becoming a bit snappy tells him humility is not thinking less of yourself but thinking of yourself less which is when it hits him he's been doing exactly the same as his dad of course these players are hurt Nate was hurt when his dad was like that to him too that might be too sudden a leap in one scene in which case you can cut that bit but either way the roast doesn't work and it leaves Nate angry with himself for making it worse. He's in a bad mood now, he's messed it up, it's adding to the pressure he's already feeling from Rupert and then he sees all of these Richmond players coming out onto the pitch, all of them happy and joking with their manager and Beard and Roy, clearly motivated and all getting on in all the ways he's failed to achieve with West Ham. Can have a clear visual contrast in the way these players feel coming out of the tunnel. So now frustrated with himself he just gives Ted the quick courtesy handshake before the game rather than any sort of apology because suddenly he's not feeling in the right mind to be apologizing. I imagine being a bit angry with himself he might be feeling like he doesn't deserve Ted's forgiveness which we'll come back to in a second. Um, they play and it's not going well for Nate. Jamie Tart is running rings around West Ham. Rupert's getting angry so he comes and tells Nate to take Jamie out of the game like he does to George. But I think I'd do this at half Half time away from the public eye rather than out on the pitch because like if the Super League scene is after this in my version it'd seem like Rupert has less sway if it's off the back of fans calling him wanker so this happens between Nate and Rupert in the tunnel at half time and they argue Suddenly, Nate, who was mostly just put up with Rupert's intimidating criticisms, is now arguing back and saying how all of Rupert's pressure isn't helping anything. That Nate even did this exact sort of thing to the players that Rupert's doing to him before the game and it only demotivated them. If Rupert wants West Ham to get over their small blip of bad results, Rupert has to trust him, not treat him like shit. Which is when Rupert pushes him. Something Isaac coming out of the dressing room witnesses in my version. Could be Will or Colin or Roy or any of them really, but just something to make sure they can be more empathetic to what Nate's going through, having witnessed some of it. Yeah, and having been pushed over, Nate won't stand for that kind of behaviour from Rupert. He resigns, then and there. Disco can manage the second half. So out come the teams for the second half and Ted sees Disco is in Nate's spot. He asks Roy where Nate is or Beard or whoever and they tell him about the argument that was witnessed. They think Nate might have resigned and Ted clearly feels concerned about Nate here. 
As part of the episode's ending, you would later on have Ted sending Nate a text to say he heard what happened and he hopes Nate's okay. That would happen in that episode. Next episode is the international break. Nate is all hiding away in bed, feeling stupid about resigning, but when Jade asks him if he regrets it, he says he didn't like the person he became when he was coaching, that that's not who he is. We see him looking at Ted's text, there's a sense he's read it several times, and he begins to type a reply, but changes his mind and deletes it all. And then most of the episode would be the same as it already is, but I think having argued with Rupert before, saying some of the sorts of things Nate feels about his dad, I think that sets up Nate perfectly to have this talk now. Also having someone in Richmond who witnessed Nate getting pushed over opens up space either now or the next episode for the players to gossip about it and have conflicting feelings towards Nate. Maybe do that next episode actually, after Will got his apology letter so that Will can chime in and tell them all about the apology and have that bit in the conversation. And then in episode 11 when Colin, Will and Isaac ask Nate to come back he can say no. Not just because he likes working at the restaurant, but also because he didn't like who he was becoming as a coach. Both of you, Will and Colin, know what I could be like. I can be horrible. I don't want to be like that anymore. That's not me. They try to point out how good he is tactically, but it doesn't persuade him. They say they've forgiven him, but no, Nate doesn't think he deserves forgiveness. He doesn't think he's changed. Jade will witness this conversation. And later on, there'll be a scene for them to talk. Jade thinks he should go back to Richmond. But no, Jay doesn't understand, she doesn't know what Nate could be like as a manager. But no, she knows exactly what he's like. He's warm, he's caring, he's thoughtful, he's someone who learns from his mistakes. Of course Nate deserves forgiveness especially from himself. Nate is a man who stood up to his own boss far more than Jade ever stood up to Derek. It'd just be nice if Nate would stand up for himself now as well. And all of that message kind of hits. It leaves Nate considering going back, but still a bit unsure until Coach Beard drops by to forgive him, which is when he finally accepts. Arguably, yeah, my version there leans a bit too heavily into Nate beating himself up, but that's something he always had a tendency to do. Something he would still have to grapple with at times. He doesn't like recognising he'd been kind of metaphorically beating his players up, so now he turns it back on himself instead. And I think, um, paradoxically, it would make Nate's return to Richmond less about just ideas of forgiveness and redemption, and more about believing in himself, believing that he can be a better coach a better motivator, that he isn't doomed to repeat his father's or Rupert's kind of attitude. And I reckon that'd be a nice place to finish his arc, not him becoming the perfect coach yet, but now trying to become it. Returning to Richmond's not because he has grown, although he definitely has in a lot of ways, but returning to Richmond because he believes he can grow in time. He can become someone who's a lot more supportive to players rather than punching down, someone who can be empathetic to them, someone who can empower them. So yeah, that would be my change to the season. Um, feel free to rip it to shreds and point out all the ways it wouldn't work as well as I've just imagined, because there will be ways this won't work, of course there will. One obvious one, I suppose, is if the West Ham game happens earlier, who the hell do Richmond play in the final episode and how do you make that a meaningful game? That's definitely a difficult question to answer. Overall, if I were to condense my thoughts on this season into a single sentence or few sentences in case I overrun, um, I'd say this. Not as good as season one, but still great. Just needed a few extra episodes to give certain arcs breathing room and more space for depth and probably also needed Bill Lawrence to tighten up the editing of episodes. Then it would have been as good if not better than season 1. Is it a better season than season 2? Um, maybe. I think they both have advantages and disadvantages. I'm sure everyone else puts season 3 as the worst season, but I'm not entirely sure. I'd have to rewatch season 2 to be certain, but off the top of my head I'm going to say Yes, I think my order would go season one the best, then season three, and then season two, and those are my thoughts. Quite a lot of them. I've been recording for two hours and 45 minutes. My god, my throat is really hurting. Um, we're stopping that here. Let me know all of the stuff you think. Let me know what I've missed, what I've got wrong, what I didn't discuss properly. Um, like the video if you liked it. Subscribe. Support me on Patreon, maybe. A big thank you to World Anvil. Um, let me know whatever the hell content you would like to come next. I've got lots of plans for other stuff. I'm going to go back to some Game of Thrones character analysis. I'm going to make some standalone videos on some individual topics. I'm going to do more Spirit of the Way 
more Katie series. Um, I said I'm gonna watch Shrinking at some point, so I might end up doing videos on that, I don't know. I'm also actually possibly doing a few more videos on Ted Lasso, I'm not sure. I have some ideas I might consider, but yeah. Let me know what you think, and otherwise, hopefully see you next time. And as ever, a special thank you goes to Luke Hoare, Treat You Kaber, Michael Gallagher, In Squares, Flying Spider, Kellyanne Davidson, Samara Salsi, Joshua C. Follier, Chad Bramwell, and Michael Hart. Thank you.